Great, thank you. Um, great introduction, so I'll move uh, right past this. So I was invited to come just speak a little bit about um, some of the current technologies, uh, the needs of the military, we're a unique population. Um, and so I'll jump right into that, but I think, um, how do I move to the next slide, to the arrows? Yep. Before I do that, I just kind of want to set the landscape for those of you that haven't worked with the military or that aren't as familiar. Um, it may seem like a blessing in disguise. We have all of these great large populations that we can recruit for our studies. Um, it's still voluntary, but we do have access to them. So for some of the intervention studies or some um, you know, long-term studies, we kind of have a little bit of a captive audience, so that's really great. A lot of our uh, population are, are eager to volunteer. They're very interested in the health, um, in the fitness. Their livelihood depends on it. They can't be promoted, they can't move on. Their paycheck is associated with this, so they're very interested in volunteering. Um, for energy expenditure, it's really a great population to work with because they usually work out together. So it's trackable, it's organized, it's easy for us if we aren't, um, we call it boots on the ground, we aren't there for the entire intervention, we can track it. Um, and for food, depending on which stage of their training they're in, they're a captive audience. And so if they're in the field, we know exactly what they're eating, uh, down to the gram, down to the micronutrient. If they're eating a dining facility, we have access to the recipes, uh, the nutrition information. So this is, is a really great um, population to work with. However, there are a few cons. Um, of course, we have limited access to them. Some of the groups we're most interested in are those that are burning a lot of calories, that um, they can't keep the weight on because they're so active. But they are also special forces, so we only can access them at certain points in their training. So we have to work really closely with our um, cadre to insert our research um, time points. And so it's not always exactly what we want, but it's as good as we can get. Um, very similar to the civilians, we have um, both ends of the spectrum. We have the special forces guys that we can't keep weight on, but they also have people on the garrison side that are overweight, that we're afraid are gonna drop out or be kicked out of the army because they can't keep their weight off. So um, there's a lot of different niches that the researchers, uh, we kind of all fit in. Um, one of the, th the cons that I, I deal with and is, is very stressful is um, the environmental extremes. So we have all these great tools and technologies, but are they gonna withstand um, summer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana? I don't know. Uh, so we need to think about all of those things before we can take something into the field and see if it really is gonna work for the warfighter. Um, cybersecurity and data privacy, privacy, we talked about this, um, it's a whole, new monster in the military. Not only do we have our firewalls um, and issues with working with cloud-based technologies, we also um, have you know, th three different branches of the military. So the Army has something, the Navy has something, the Air Force has something. So it's just because we can jump through one hoop in the Army doesn't mean that we can transition it across all branches. So kind of, now you see it's not always the best, um, it's, a, it's a good, mix of both. So I thought I would just start by with energy expenditure because we've done a lot of work in this area with technologies. Um, a lot of what I'm showing you are techniques that we use in the civilian world. Um, prediction equations, um, obviously we can't use a Harris Benedict with an activity factor when we have someone carrying a load or working in um, you know, unique terrain, sand, um, for a ruck march of 14 miles, like that's very unique. So we've come up a lot with our own prediction equations and with new technologies and with new modeling. Um, those have morphed and changed. Of course, these are group estimates. And so um, I was talking with Edward this morning, you know, our new mission is really becoming more individualized. And so how can we break down these equations and make them more individualized from the group kind of averages that we've been getting. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. We've used um, accelerometry, wrist and hip mostly. And um, again, a lot of the issues are when they work great in the lab, but then when we take them into the field, um, there's issues and how to overcome those. Not to mention the data that comes out is a lot of work because we need to you know, calculate exactly 
how we're going to incorporate the load, the environmental extremes, um, and so on. So the overall output, we're not really sure if this is the way to go. Um, so we've been looking at other options. Of course, we've used activity records. Um, we've used IPACs for from some of our longer term intervention studies just to kind of get a baseline and an idea of physical activity. This is mostly used when we have um, a, a captive audience for you know, mid-size studies, so anywhere like under 100 um, that we would see at regular time points. But of course, it's labor intensive. Um, the areas that I work in are really the more um, objective measures. So we're looking at using mobile or stationary metabolic systems, W labeled water. Of course, both are expensive. And when we're looking at larger groups of people, a platoon, we have to kind of take a small subgroup and we'll follow them with W labeled water. Or, um, you know, we, I only have six Oxycons, which is a lot for some people, but it's really only six guys that I can track, or women, um, throughout the whole study, and I have to draw conclusions about the entire group based on those six people. So, um, so we're looking for new technologies, new tools, um, and so that's kind of how I moved over into this group. So I was born in the military nutrition um, group, and I moved over into the biomedical and biomodeling group because they're looking to build their team. So we have um, exercise physiologists, we have um, I'm their nutrition dietitian, and it's all modelers and engineers. And um, there's, it's really cool and challenging to sit around the table and talk. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's kind of like we were saying here, I think that's how new innovations are gonna come. So, um, so if I'm gonna just start with some of the technology um, advancements for energy expenditure, and we've worked a lot lately on prediction equations. We have some older ones that are more load carriage, but kind of focusing on more individualized. And so since everything we have is group, what if we just focus on specific groups, so special forces? So since I've been um, with USARIUM, we've done 12 different studies with a very similar study design using dumb labeled water with the special forces looking at um, just different training scenarios. So when they're at the dive school or when they're in their pre-ranger training. Um, so if we're able to pull those 12 different scenarios and have almost the exact same study design, we could pool the data and we could look at how um, we can estimate energy expenditure for these folks using um, things that we can actually measure. And so th these are two different models for two different equations. And so what we were actually able to determine with this great pooling of data is that using, um, we, we made like a physical activity level. So we kind of quartiled the different activities. Um, some that were just basic menial skills, cleaning their weapons, things like that, to the most extreme. And um, that is, you know, their energy expenditure is closely associated with their body weight and their fat-free body mass. And so if we were able to get those measures when they first come into the training, um, we know that what it, they're doing, because we can track exactly what they're doing in their training, we can calculate their physical activity, energy expenditure, so that we can um, more properly give them guidance on nutrition to get through their training and to be successful. And so this is just one um, example that I was able to pull out because um, it was more recent. Uh, we've been working quite a bit using um, machine assisted, I said computer assisted, uh, modeling. But this scenario is a modeling that we've been using in my group before I came for a long period of time just to estimate core body temperature. So one of the big things for the warfighter when they're in the field in these extreme temperatures is um, when are they gonna experience heat stress and they're gonna have to fall out. And so we've been trying to predict their body temperature, but now there's new technology. There's a great little pill that we can have them swallow and we get real body core temperature. So what if we break down this whole model and we work it backwards? And so we know what their heart rate is, what their core body temperature is, can we use the environmental conditions, their personal characteristics, their height, weight, all those kind of things to predict their energy expenditure? So that's what we're working on right now. So in order to do modeling like this, we need a lot of data. So we're in the process of pooling data from a bunch of studies that have these exact measurements so that we can see if we can, once we've 
deconstructed and rebuilt the scenario model, is that something that we can use um, for the warfighter? One of the most recent projects that I've come in on is um, an, an app that we're putting together. And so this is more for a logistician or someone that's in the group with the warfighters and that's planning a training activity. And so this application um, is still under construction, but basically they would go in and it's all of these different, kind of like the scenario model, it's a bunch of different models pulled into this one application. So if you know the height, the weight, if they are, acclimated to going to altitude, all these things can be put in, including the environmental inputs, um, specifically what they're wearing. There's a screen where you can actually pack their pack. So um, the way that their pack is on their back uh, differentiates how many calories they're burning. So, um, and a GPS. And so through this app, we're able to give some outputs, which is really small down here, that we're working on. Um, so, in general, how much energy are you going to expend? What about your, um, your, what recommendations do we have? What did you pack on you for dietary intake? What are, you know, what are our recommendations? What about hydration? Um, what are we estimating you would need to carry with you? So this is kind of like a, a plan if you were going to go into training um, and you knew all of the, um, the inputs ahead of time. So this is a work in progress. Um, so this is my project right now. So I'm really interested in real-time measurement. I want to give real feedback to the warfighter in a training scenario. So um, this is called the COBRA. Um, and it's the carbon dioxide, oxygen, breath, and respiration analyzer. But we had to make it sound cool so the guys <laughs> want to try it. Um, it's about this big. So it's a tenth of the size um, and about a tenth of the cost of an Oxycon, which right now we are comparing to. So if you're familiar with that, it's something like you would put on your vest, or we have the guys put it in their, um, their flick vests, but they have to wear a mask. So in the field, it's a nightmare, because the seal on their mask is the most critical piece of the entire unit. And if they're doing um, a 12 or even a six mile ruck march, they need to be able to drink, they need to be able to talk. So this is not something we can use in the field. So the point of developing this with our partners at MIT was something that can be used intermittently. So they would have a holster kind of on their vest where they could rest it, take it out, put it in, and there'll be a sensor um, or a light that will tell them when we're done recording so that they can be done, they can take a drink, they can eat, they can talk to their buddy next door, they'd get some kind of buzzing or sense, put it back in. And so this would help us kind of keep track of during that ruck march or during this training how many you know, calories are they burning? How can we help them recover? And so um, really it all comes down to, because I'm a dietitian, recovery nutrition. We don't know what to give them because we don't know exactly what they're doing. So the first kind of um, piece is figuring out what they're doing. So we just finished the validation of the COBRA in the lab in a controlled environment. And um, I compared it to the metabolic cart, the Parvomedics. And um, it looks very good. It's very similar. Um, we correlated during four different work levels. So we had them rest, walk, jog, and run. And I was really impressed with the COBRA. We also compared the COBRA to um, Oxycons. So doing the exact same setup um, across the, the four different activities. And it looks as good, if not better, than the Oxycon. So one of the issues with Oxycon is reliability. I don't know how many of you guys have used them before, but. Um, they're not really easy to work with, and so we've had a lot of problems with um, data loss, et cetera. But this is another promising technology for a real objective um, measure. So I'm gonna transition into the um, dietary intake methods. So we haven't done as much work in this area, um, and I think it's because it's a little bit more difficult. There's so many different pieces to this pie. Um, and so right now we're using a lot of the traditional methods. We use food um, frequency questionnaires, the block questionnaires, the ASN 24s, um, and we just kind of get a rough idea for our larger groups when we have 300 um, soldiers in a study. We just want an idea of what their nutritional you know, intake is on, on average. Um, when we have like more of a mid-level study, so we have an intervention time point, um, for instance, with the Special Forces, we have a pre, a post, and a recovery. We can do 24-hour recalls and get more of a glimpse of exactly what they're consuming. Um, but it requires a smaller 
you know, population size, and um, you know, it's always fun with all the input and everything. Afterwards, it takes a little while. Food records, we've tried both paper and electronic. Um, they're just a lot of work, and they require a lot of the one-on-one -on -one time that we don't necessarily have um, with a warfighter. One cool thing is in the field, um, they usually consume rations, and so we have an awesome database um, that is, we call it RAS, and we actually just put an app up that goes with it. It's called Comrade, and it's every single um, ration component, and it's been chemically analyzed. And so um, now there's going to be photos that are uploaded with it. So, so you have a really good idea of what they're consuming in the field. It's just when they're eating in the dining facility and in the field, it's a little bit consuming, but nowhere near as much as the free living population that you guys are all dealing with. Um, usually what we do when we have um, an on-site study is visual estimation, which has kind of been grandfathered out into food photography now. So we have a really kind of streamlined setup where we have the soldiers go through the dining facility line, come to our station, we take a picture, they come up at the end, we take a picture after. So we're able to figure out um, their dietary intake that way. Of course, it's a lot of burden um, on the staff before and after um, to assess the photos, to build the database, et cetera. So we're always looking for new and great technologies. Um, one of the advancements that we've been working on that's in the validation right now is a military-specific questionnaire. So um, based on the three different branches, we have a number of questions um, that will, will kind of make it a level playing ground, whether you're in the Navy um, or the Air Force, which always eats better than the Army and the Navy. Um, so that they're the same questions, but they kind of get at you know, eating behaviors, um, even knowledge, what kind of supplements you're taking. Um, so right now, the questionnaire is pretty lengthy. It takes 40 to 60 minutes to complete. But we're hoping once the validation is complete that we can narrow it down and it's a little bit quicker. But um, of course, we have all of the um, input from the Army and the Marines. But the Air Force and the Navy, we're still waiting to kind of fill for our, our population statistics, we had to make sure that we have e you know, equal representation across the way that the three branches are divided. So this could take a little bit longer than we had expected. Um, can you tell us the question they did? Is this a, a food frequency question? Or is it very similar. Yeah, very similar to like a food frequency. There's pieces of it that are similar, but it also incorporates your eating behavior and some of your um, like nutrition knowledge. So it's a little bit deeper than that. And it also, um, some of your experiences with military feeding. So, so little, it's unique, just because we have a unique population. Um, but we did work with um, Block to kind of help understand and to do some of our statistics to have it be as close to a questionnaire um, food frequency as we can, but with like a little bit more. How long does it take to administer? 40 to 60 minutes right now. So it's a little bit longer than we want, but we're hoping we can tease out a couple of the questions that might be repetitive. Um, once we finish the validation. Is the GRC as well as Comrade? Yes, so we're right now, we, we, um, I think we've done everything in the Army, so we try to get a bunch of different groups. Um, and so it's kind of a gamut of all different um, MOSs. So this was hopefully my collaboration that we proposed, um, Edward and I put together. But um, so my passions were covering nutrition, and so we have on the brinks, like a cool way to capture energy expenditure, but how do I capture what they're eating? And so um, Edward and I got together, we put together a proposal, we were hoping to use his um, automated ingestion monitor to um, mount to the helmet or to the goggles when they're in the field, because I already have this really great um, database of all the ration food um, and pictures, and so it was just like a perfect partnership. Um, but we aren't 100% sure if our proposal got picked up or not. Uh, but this is a future of something that we're really interested in doing, is using um, a technology where um, it's still in development. Sometimes when I find something that's um, a commercial off the shelf or a COT system, it's really hard to get um, the designers to take a step back and to take it out of the cloud so that they can work with me. Um, so, so this is kind of a perfect um, partnership if, if we can move it forward. Um, so I guess 
my bottom line and my conclusion is what we're looking for in the military really are a lot of things we're looking for in the civilian population. We're looking to move from a group to more of an individualized or a personalized um, technology or tool. Um, we're hoping that it can be semi-automated, if not passive, um, so that it's you know not doesn't have to be one of the top three things that the warfighter thinks of, but it can, in the end, really help them achieve their mission and be successful by some integrated feedback. And so, so we know we've got a long way to go, but I think um, really working as an interdisciplinary team um, is getting us a step closer. So, so thanks for having us. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Sure. Sometimes if they're yeah, in garrison, so yeah. I'm, I'm tied to a few people that are in there, but I guess sort of like the goal is to. So there's a lot of, it, when I crossed over from civilian to military, there was a lot to learn in the process and the politics of working mm -hmm. in the military. There's um, an MDRI, so a military DRI, and it's uh -huh. it fits all. Yeah. Um, and so recently, um, when we put together the nutritional standards for the military, um, something that we could control is like their operational feeding. And so there's a difference between um, what their needs are if they are like on short-term missions, so we call it like a restricted ration versus an operational ration where it's more long-term. Um, so we kind of are slowly starting, but policy takes a while to change. And so the other issue is, um, you know, there's a lot of great research coming out for the military, but how does it actually get to the warfighter? And how it gets to the warfighter is it like trickles down. So if we go in with a cool new technology or a tool that the warfighter can actually get personal feedback from, they're more likely to actually understand how their body is their biggest, you know, machine or weapon that they need to, to keep track of so that they can they need to eat because once they see yeah once they understand and they use a technology in their training they're more likely to understand oh yeah I remember when I felt that way and then when I went into the shooting range I couldn't hit any of my targets so I need to eat that bar right now so learning more about themselves because that's kind of a piece that's missing from their training sure Naomi So um, the 3D printing is a part of combat feeding. So um, they sit on the same installation as us. And so um, what's really cool is a lot of the things we find in our rece research, we're able to just walk across the street and say, hey, you know, we just finished this study and you need to put this protein in the ration. And so then the food technologists can incorporate it. So the food technologists are working on 3D printing. Um, I know it's a lot more involved than they thought it was gonna be, um, but that still is the futuristic plan is that you could ultimately um, come off of a training, set down your technologies, and um, they could you know, instantly go into a 3D printer and it could print out exactly what you need. I mean, that's definitely still a futuristic goal. Um, it's just how long it's gonna take to get there. So like, I don't understand it all, but extruding protein is really difficult to like get it to print. So carbohydrates, sweets, like all the great desserts that you see on TV, but protein is really hard. <laughs> So I know that was one of the issues that the food technologists have been working on. So do the wearables, are the wearables working in terms of monitoring the electronic losses and you know, energy transfer? I thought there was something about that. So, so there, I know that one of, um, one of the investigators in my group is working on the wearable shirt and monitoring um, you know, micronutrient loss, sweat losses. Um, so. So it's, it's moving in the right direction. Right now, it's patches. 
so then you got to move it to the next. So it's all these stages. Once you get there, then you got to move it to the next step, which would be an actual um, issued shirt that the warfighter would wear. Um, I know there are a lot of other questions behind me, but we're going to need to break for lunch because we are behind the schedule already. And you, you can drill her while she's trying to. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks.